Well, good morning, church family. It is good to be with you on this, the Lord's Day. And uh, I am looking forward to our time of fellowship afterward at the Laidlaw Farm. And so let me just uh, extend my invitation to you as well, that even if you're brand new uh, this morning, uh, or you, are, uh, you've, you didn't bring any food, or you're not very well prepared, we'd invite you to come. If you're on live stream and you didn't come out to church, but you want to come out to a picnic, come on along. We'd love to have you. And um, so just, uh, yeah, it is good for us to be together on a Sunday morning, and it's also good together for us to be together on a Sunday afternoon for a time of fellowship as a church family. We are, as many of you know, in a series in the Gospel of John, and we began uh, about two months ago, and we are now uh, at, uh, really, the beginning of chapter 3. If you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 2. We're going to begin in John chapter 2. We're going to read from verses 23 onward until John 3, 21. So if you would stand with me for the reading of God's Word. It's on page... 887 in the church Bible, that would be of help to you, page 887, John 2, 23 through 3, 21, hear what Holy Scripture says. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part was not, or sorry, Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the Teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes is not condemned, or sorry, yeah, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, 
because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is the word of the Lord. Friends, you may be seated as we pray. Father, we come to you as a blessed people. We are blessed in Jesus. We are blessed by your Holy Spirit. We are blessed through the fellowship of this church body. We also come to you desperately needy. We are sinners by nature. We love the darkness by nature. We are prideful by nature. We neglect you and are idolatrous by nature. And so, Father, I pray that you be with us in these moments, that you be at work in us by your Holy Spirit to convict us, to challenge us, to comfort us, and to encourage us through the preaching of your word as it is opened up in the assembly of your people. God, I pray that you'd help us to better understand John chapter 3 so that we can live lives that are more honoring to you, our great God and Savior. We pray these things in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. George Whitfield was one of the most significant figures in the Great Awakening of the 18th century. George Whitfield ministered on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean in Britain and in America. In fact, over the course of his life, and this is before the age of airplanes, he made 13 cross-Atlantic trips, which means that he made seven evangelistic tours from Britain to the American colonies. Whitfield was known for many things. One of the things that he was known for is that he had unorthodox methods of preaching. Whitfield was one of the first ones to go into the open air and to preach outside the walls of the established church. It was unheard of in those days to go, for example, and preach in an open field to a crowd that had gathered to hear the preaching. On one occasion... Whitfield preached to over 20,000 people in an open-air meeting in the Boston Commons. That probably was the largest gathering that had taken place on American soil up until that time. Remember, that's without, amplific without amplification and without even the acoustics of a church building to help Whitfield's voice. He was a roaring lion for the cause of the gospel. He preached some 18,000 sermons over his lifetime. Only about 80 of those are preserved, or I should say only 80 of those were published. And probably the most famous, the most well-known of Whitfield's sermons is his sermon on the new birth. Whitfield preached often on the new birth. In fact, he preached so often on the new birth that one of his friends asked him, Mr. Whitfield, why do you preach so often? that you must be born again? Whitfield looked to his friend and responded, because you must be born again. That was the heart of the great evangelist, George Whitfield, and that is the heart of his great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, in our text, has been ministering in Jerusalem. You remember last week that he made quite the splash at the temple in the capital. And while many were placing their trust in Jesus because he was performing many signs, the text tells us that he was not entrusting himself to them because he knew what is in man. 
even though the crowds were placing superficial trust in Jesus, Jesus was not putting his trust in them. He was not entrusting himself to the crowds because he knows all people. He knows what goes on in the hearts and the minds of men. He knew what was in man. He was omniscient. He was all-knowing because he was God. And now the camera lens changes its focus from the Jewish elite, from the Jewish leaders, to a particular Pharisee. And the text shifts its focus from the crowds, from mankind, to a single man. And I want to take this morning to meet and to be introduced to this man. This man was named Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Nicodemus, and we'll learn about him as we move our way through this sermon. But just to provide the briefest background information, Nicodemus was of the Pharisees. There were 6,000 Pharisees in the time of Jesus, and they were well-respected amongst the people. The Pharisees were meticulous observers of God's law and of their own traditions. Nicodemus was also a ruler of the Jews. This is probably a reference to the fact that Nicodemus was part of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of Jerusalem, the supreme court of Israel, as it were. Nicodemus is also a wealthy man. So Nicodemus is a wealthy man, and he's also respected and powerful in first century Israel. Nicodemus is the poster child religious man. And so Nicodemus is a good representative of the Jewish elite. He's also a good representative of the Jewish people. And more broadly, I think that Nicodemus is a good representative of the religious man in every age, every era of history. So the question that we should ask is, what does Jesus have to say to the religious man, to the respectable man, to the good man? To put it into sort of modern categories, perhaps we could imagine Jesus meeting with major world leaders or a major world leader. What would it look like for Jesus to meet with the Dalai Lama of Tibetan Buddhism? What would it look like for Jesus to meet the Pope of Roman Catholicism? What kind of a conversation would take place? Now, of course, we can't know for certain because such conversations never happened. But I want us to understand that the conversation taking place between Jesus and Nicodemus is not Jesus and average Joe. It is a conversation that is taking place between Jesus and a well-respected religious leader in first century Israel. So in the text, Nicodemus comes and asks a question. There's clearly some interest in Jesus, but there's not yet a full-blown faith in Jesus. So Nicodemus comes and he asks Jesus a question. And Jesus responds to Nicodemus There's no greeting, no pleasantries. He doesn't beat around the bush. He gets right to the point. You must be born again. In fact, that's the title of the first heading. Heading number one, you must be born again. You must be born again. This is in verses one through eight of chapter three. Three, one through eight is you must be born again again. Now, Nicodemus, I'm not sure if you noticed, probably doesn't understand what Jesus is saying. So he responds with a bit of sarcasm, or if you're British, with some cheekiness. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born to an odd thought. And Jesus basically says the same thing 
with some elaboration. He mentions the new birth in verses 5 through 8 four times in four verses. In verse 5, it says, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he can't, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. Now, this phrase, born of water and the Spirit, that word water, some people think it refers to physical birth. Perhaps it refers to the amniotic fluid. Others would say, well, it refers to Christian or to baptism, whether the baptism of John or Christian baptism. However, I think that the best way to understand this phrase, born of water and the Spirit, is actually to turn to the Old Testament. I don't normally have you turn to other passages in your Bibles, but I will this time. Turn with me to Ezekiel 36. It's on page 724 in the church Bible. Ezekiel 36, page 724, and we're going to read verses 25 through 27. Ezekiel 36, page 724, verses 25 through 27, and then let me just read this portion of Scripture. Remember, we're trying to understand the phrase, born of water and the Spirit. What could Jesus mean by being born of water and the Spirit. I think Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27 helps us. I will, this is the Lord speaking, I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. What God is promising through the prophet Ezekiel is that he is going to one day cleanse his people from all their idolatry through an eschatological bath. God is going to perform heavenly surgery to remove the cancerous heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And God is going to place his spirit in those newly renovated hearts so that his people would obey God's commandments from the heart. Nicodemus, you don't know about this? Are you not the reverend professor doctor of the scriptures in Israel? Have you ever read Ezekiel? It's like one of the books in the middle of the Torah, one of the prophets, the, one of the big ones. Have you ever read Ezekiel? Have you ever read Jeremiah? He talks about it too, this thing called the new birth. You've never heard about this. You're not even remotely aware of this. If you're the teacher of Israel and you don't know about this, then how does that reflect upon Israel as a whole? And remember that Jesus has been talking about seeing and entering the kingdom. And this word, the kingdom, really sh does not show up much in the Gospel of John. Kingdom is more of a word that's used in Matthew, Luke, and Mark, but um, the word kingdom doesn't really appear a lot in John's Gospel, but it does appear twice here, and Jesus talks about seeing and entering the kingdom. That's important. For the Jewish people, it would have been unthinkable that they would be denied access to the kingdom. The only Jews that would be barred access from the eschatological kingdom were those who committed apostasy. That is, they completely denied the Jewish faith and um, you know, uh, engaged in uh, complete, complete idolatry or just pagan worship or something like that. Or the only other people that would be barred access from the kingdom if you were a Jewish were those who committed extraordinary wickedness. So 
the thinking in Nicodemus' mind would be something like this. If the general people are a shoe in for the kingdom, how much more for a person like me who is of the ruling class and the sect of the Pharisees? If the general population is allowed access into the kingdom by virtue of their being Jewish, how much more will I be granted access because I am a ruler of the Jews and I am amongst the religious elite of the Jews? Jesus throws, he, well, he pulls the pin and he throws a grenade into the thinking of Nicodemus. He blows that whole system up he blows up that whole way of thinking. He does it cleverly. He does it uh, sophisticatedly. He does it directly. He blows it up. If you want to enter the kingdom, if you want to ev- enter heaven, then you must receive a total renovation and renewal of the heart. Remember that Nicodemus would have been greatly respected. His knowledge of the scriptures and of Jewish traditions would have been very impressive. He was a moral exemplar in that society. He was a man of virtue and amongst the elite. And even he could not enter the kingdom apart from the divine intervention of the spirit of God. I think that there are many people today who think like Nicodemus. I think that there are some of you in this room who think like Nicodemus. That you will one day go to heaven because you are a good person with a good heart who does good deeds. And friend, I don't doubt that you're a nice person. I'm sure that you're a much nicer and more patient person than me. I don't doubt that you try your best. I don't doubt that you do good deeds for your neighbors. But if I may be so bold as to say, that's just not good enough according to the God of the scriptures. You and I, along with Nicodemus, are more broken than we might appear at first glance. The problem with human beings is not that they do bad things, it's that we are bad to the core of our souls. So what Jesus is kindly telling Nicodemus and to Nicodemus and also to us is that what we need, what all humanity needs is not to turn over a new leaf. But what we desperately need is a new birth and a new heart because we are broken and sinful to the core. You see, when we approach God and the question that we have for God is something along these lines, what can I do for God so that I can one day enter into heaven? That's just the wrong question. The question that we must ask is, what must God do for me that I cannot do for myself? What this passage teaches us is that for us to see the kingdom, for us to enter into eternal joy, it's not to have a Christian heritage. It's not to be a morally upright person. It's not to try your best to be a good person. It's not by having your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. No, what you need is for God to powerfully work in your life to cause you to be born again. What you need and what I need because we are sinful to the core is for God to give us new hearts. He needs to grant to us the new birth question I have for you then is, have you been born again? Have you experienced a transformation of the heart? And do you see the need for this kind of heart renovation? 
That's the question that's on the table. Now, Jesus talks in here about the new birth, and then he also uses um, the imagery of the wind. Because I say you must be born again, and then you might ask the question, well, how can I be born again? We're going to get into that in just a moment. But from the Christian's perspective, like I I have a younger brother, his name is Koji, whom I dearly love. He is lost. He does not know the Lord Jesus. And I wish that I could just manipulate or concoct or manufacture some sort of solution in which Koji would be saved. I can't do that. But God can. And so how regeneration happens and when that happens and to whom it happens is a bit of a mystery. Jesus likens the new birth to the wind. We don't know where the wind comes from or where it's going. We cannot control or master the wind. We can't control and manipulate God to work in the ways that we would want him to work in the timing that we want him to work. We just can't do that. We can't control or master the wind, but we do experience the wind's effects. Ask a kid who's trying to fly a kite. And so it is with the new birth. We cannot control or master the spirit, but we do see evidence of the spirit's work in the lives of those he touches. So Maple Avenue Baptist Church, may our prayer be this. May the wind of the spirit blow in this church and in this community for the good of the people that we preach to and for the glory of God. May the wind of the Spirit blow. Second, you must believe in the Son. Second, you must believe in the Son. Verses 9 through 21, you must believe in the Son. Verses 9 through 21. Jesus says, Hey Nicodemus, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And you can just and Nicodemus doesn't exactly tell us the question that was on his mind, or he doesn't exactly tell us what was on his mind as he approached Jesus, because he's not given much of an opportunity to talk or to ask him further questions. But you could imagine that Nicodemus may have been coming to Jesus to ask him about the nature and the details of the kingdom. And so Jesus is saying, hey, if you can't even find the front door to the house, what's the point of me telling you about the inside of the house? If you don't even grasp how to enter the kingdom, Nicodemus, there's really no point in me telling you about the details of the eschatological kingdom. We'll consider the second heading under three words. The image, the purpose, and the rejection. The image, the purpose, and the rejection. It's just a longer piece of text, so I've divided it up into three subheadings. The image, the purpose, and the rejection. First, the image. The image, again, comes from the Old Testament. This time from the book of Numbers. The Israelites were traveling And along the journey, they grew impatient. And so they began to grumble or to complain against God and against his servant, Moses. And so God sends a plague amongst the Israelites. And some of you will shriek at this. This plague that God sent was snakes. Not only were they snakes, but they were poisonous snakes. And so they began to bite the people. And those bitten people began to die. And so the people cried out, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you, speaking to Moses. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents for us. And so Moses prays to God. And the Lord provides this method 
of salvation. Build a serpent made of bronze. Lift that bronze serpent up on a high and tall pole. Lift that serpent amongst Lift that sermon up amongst the people and instruct them. If a person in Israel is bit by the serpent, and if they would look to the bronze serpent, they will live. Now, I don't always love to do sort of like what you know, um, Bible scholars would call hermeneutics or kind of show you my work, as it were, in terms of Bible study in a sermon setting. I feel like that's more appropriate, like in a Bible class or a Bible study setting. But I think this one is helpful, so let me kind of do that just for a brief moment. I think this would be a helpful moment to talk about typology. Typology is one of the ways that the New Testament uses the Old Testament. Now, if I talk to you about how the New Testament uses the Old Testament, most of you think of, most of us think of direct prophetic fulfillment. So, for example, Micah 5 tells us that the coming messianic ruler will uh, will come forth from Bethlehem, and lo and behold, Jesus is born in Bethlehem. That would be direct prophetic fulfillment. Another way, though, that the New Testament uses the Old Testament is this thing called typology. Let me explain how typology works. In typology, there is a type and there is an antitype. And for our purposes here, the type is in the Old Testament and the antitype is in the New Testament. And the type and the antitype look similar to one another. Okay, the type and the antitype correspond with one another. But the other important element to note about typology is that from the type to the antitype, there is an escalation. There is a, a lifting up. There's more significance with the antitype than with the type. So in the original event, a bronze serpent was lifted up. And those who looked upon the serpent lived. In the new event, Jesus will be lifted up on the cross, and all who look to him will live. They look similar. But there's an escalation, okay? There's a difference. The people who looked at the serpent were, grant, it were granted extended physical life. But those who looked at Jesus will be granted eternal spiritual life. Furthermore, in, in Numbers, a bronze serpent that Moses constructed was lifted up on the pole for the sake of Israel, but now the Son who was sent from heaven will be lifted up on the cross for the sake of the world. And so Jesus is masterfully using the Old Testament to undergird and to explain the significance of his earthly ministry, which will culminate in him being lifted up on the cross. Let's consider then the purpose. We've considered the image. I want to consider the purpose. The purpose. Why did Jesus come? That is the most important question that you as a human being will ever answer. Why did Jesus come? Well, first, he came as an expression of God's love for the world. To put it even more simply, Jesus came because God loves the world. And since God loves the world, he gave his one and only son, which means that God gave his best and the most to the world as an expression of his love for the world. This is shocking. This is shocking not because the world is so big with the seven or eight billion people upon planet Earth now and all the people across the centuries. No, this is shocking because the world is so bad. That's the sense of the word world in our passage. 
And from Nicodemus' perspective, this is shocking because the world is so very non-Jewish. God loves, then, the broken, sinful, and gentilic people of the world. And so he sent his son into the world to save the world. Do you see that in verse 17? I'm not just making this up or pulling this out of thin air. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The purpose of God sending his son was so that individuals in the world might be saved through him. God by nature is a saving God. When he planned his decree for the cosmos, what he wanted to be at the center of history and of the universe was his love for sinners on display through the sacrificial death of his son on a cross to the praise of his glorious grace. He wanted the cross to be central to the unfolding of all of history and of the universe. God has demonstrated his love then for sinners like you by sending his son. He was condemned in your place. He was mocked, shamed, and scorned for you. He took upon himself your sins as your substitute. Now, perhaps you're here today and you wonder this very question. But does God love me? I know that's what it says. I know that's what I'm supposed to believe. But sometimes I just struggle to know whether God loves me or not. Perhaps sometimes it's very trivial things. Like you could imagine one of your kids asking today, it's like, well, if God can do everything, why didn't he cause it to not rain today for the church picnic? But there's more significant things, aren't there? Like perhaps you had a bad relationship with your father, so it's difficult for you to grasp the love of a father. Or perhaps you have a really broken past with broken relationships and all kinds of baggage. And you just feel unlovable. Friend, if we could for a moment suspend those thoughts and fix our thoughts on the one who was suspended on the cross for us. It means this. All of the baggage from your past, all of the guilt which is upon your shoulders and which is crushing you, all the shame that you carry around with you like a backpack of bricks on your back, it was nailed and pierced to the, it was pierced on the cross on the body of your Savior. Friend, I know what it's like to have a rocky relationship with your earthly father, which distorts your view of your heavenly father. But as God was ordering the stars and the planets, and as he is controlling history to his desired end, it's as if he had people like you and me in mind and said, son, daughter, do you want to know the depths of my love for you? I gave my son to the world. And my son gave up his life as he was lifted up on the cross. And I did all of that. I ordered the, his, the history of the world and all things happening in the universe was so that my plan of redemption be carried out in my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I did that for 
you so that you could become my son and my daughter. I love you, says to his children. Ready? Will you place your trust in him? Will you believe in him? Will you look to him and live? You see, because there is no other hope for this unlovely world except in the love of God for the world. Now, a question that you might have, I, I would venture to say that you would have it if you've been a Christian for any amount of time. Why don't all people believe in Jesus? If the gospel is the greatest expression of God's love the world has ever known, and if the gospel is the solution to the greatest problem that we all have, why don't more people believe in it? Why do most people in our society reject it? Last, let's consider the rejection. The rejection. You can offer all kinds of reasons of why a person might not believe in Jesus. Um, you could offer intellectual reasons. You could offer uh, cultural reasons or the way that they were raised and grew up. But according to this verse, a fundamental reason that people refuse to believe in the gospel is because they do not want their sins exposed. Look at verse 20. That's what it says. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light as does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. The fundamental reason that people do not come to Jesus, it's not cultural. It's not intellectual. But it is moral and spiritual. Contrary to common belief, People are not neutral at birth, and they can choose to go the good way or the bad. Unfortunately for all of us, we are born into this world by default as sinners. And therefore, unfortunately, all people love sin. And so, they would prefer to remain in the darkness rather than come to the light so for many people, if we dug deep enough, this is why they do not want to follow Jesus. It is because they love their lifestyle. They love their sin, and following Jesus would mean relinquishing what they ha love, and they just can't do that. And so they choose to remain in the darkness. But there's a way for a moral, upright and respectable person to remain in the darkness as well. And this is important for me to draw out because we're talking here about Nicodemus, remember. As a Pharisee, I think there would have been sins that he would have loved to hold on to. Spiritual pride, a sense of ethnic superiority, a love for money. But for a religious man like Nicodemus, it would also mean that coming to the light would expose his sinfulness. Which would mean that for a Pharisee, he would need to relinquish all confidence in himself. He would need to admit that the system of religion that he has constructed to achieve and to demonstrate his right standing with God, he would need to admit that that has been entirely useless. And so for many Pharisees, that was too costly. And so they chose to remain in the darkness under the facade of their self-righteousness and moral uprightness. You see, the cross proclaims loudly to all the world and to all who are willing to hear. The cross proclaims from the throne of heaven, I love you. 
But that loud shout from heaven also addresses the world as sinners. I love you, sinners. And that badge of sinner is not something that the religious man is willing to wear. Now, this is not the last that we hear of Nicodemus in the Gospel of John. He shows up again in John 7. You don't have to turn there, but Jesus was in Jerusalem for a feast. And Jesus' signs and teaching is causing division. There was a debate between the officers and the chief priests and the Pharisees. And the chief priests, or sorry, the officers were saying, this guy's unique. No one has ever spoken like this man, Jesus. And the chief priests and the Pharisees retorted, have you also been deceived? Are you crazy? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? And then Nicodemus, who likely felt somewhat caught in the middle, he was a Pharisee, remember? Friends, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? In John 3, Nicodemus was clearly not a believer. In John 7, Nicodemus is clearly defending Jesus. And then, this is astounding. We arrive at the end of the Gospel of John, and Jesus has completed his... He has ascended the hill of Golgotha. He has been lifted up on the cross to die for the sins of the world as the Savior of the world. And as he is hanging upon that cross, he cries out, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The soldiers bring the body of Jesus down from the cross, and there are two men who are involved in the proper burial of the Lord Jesus. The first was Joseph of Arimathea. He was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, and he was also a wealthy man. One of his colleagues supplied the spices for the burial. The spices for the burial were a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. Jesus was mockingly called King of the Jews with the inscription upon the cross. And now Jesus appropriately receives a burial fit for a king. And the two men who were responsible for this proper burial were Joseph of Arimathea, and Nicodemus, who John says had come earlier to Jesus by night. Do you want to know what that means? It's somewhere between John chapter 3 and John chapter 19, the wind of the Spirit blew in the life of Nicodemus. Friends, let us pray to that end. That the wind of the Spirit of God would blow through this church. That this wind of the Spirit would blow through our community of Halton Hills and beyond. And that the wind of the Spirit would blow to cause new birth to take place in the hearts of sinners. For their good, our joy, and for the glory of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, what a, on the one hand, a, a joyous text, and then on the other hand, a, a sobering text. And I just pray that you take the words that were spoken here from this pulpit this morning, and that you would do your work as you see fit, both in the lives of your people and in the lives of those who do not know you yet. I pray and I plead with you, O oh God, that you would cause your spirit to work, and to be operative in our church, in Georgetown, in Halton Hills, in southern Ontario, in the nation of Canada, and across the globe. I pray that you would cause the wind of the Spirit to blow. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.